welcome everybody who's just coming into the webinar. We're just kind of having people flow in and then we'll get started. I'm a stickler for time, so I think we'll just go. Let's just go. Let's do this we'll thing. Go, go. All right. So welcome to Cultivating Workplaces That Support New Parents. I'm Sasha Mayer. I'm the co-founder of Mama Va. And most people know about our company from seeing our lactation pods in public spaces like airports. Those There's the big, beautiful, bodaciously optimistic spaces designed for um, parents to, to breastfeed or use their breast pumps. Um, but actually the vast majority of our work is done with private employers in the breastfeeding space. And my role, besides being a co-founder at Mama Va, is actually, I think the a coolest title, title there can be is a CXO, so Chief Experience Officer. And that means it's product experience and designed, brand experience, but closest to my heart is actually company culture experience is what we're going to be focusing on today. And before I introduce our excellent moderator. I just want to do a few housekeeping uh, details here. So we are recording this webinar and we will be sending uh, re that recording back out via email for all the registrants. And we're definitely going to leave time for Q&A at the end of this session, but please use the Q&A channel um, at the bottom of your Zoom uh, during it. And my um, colleague, Megan, who has been extremely helpful. She is the producer and technologist behind making this all work. Um, we'll make sure that we get those questions. So today, our moderator is my friend, Sarah Olin. She is the founder and CEO of Lumo. She is truly a luscious mother, which is what <laughs> Lumo stands for. And she's the leading voice in professional coaching and organizational transformation for working parents. Sarah has been an executive coach and leadership trainer for 12 years, specializing in supporting working professionals transition into working parenthood, which we all know is a really important space to be focused on. And Sarah has coached and trained leaders at places like the NBA, Calvin Klein, Adobe, and countless others. She's also um, my fashion inspiration. So I always love to be doing work and seeing uh, her beautiful face show up on Zoom. All right, I'll hand it over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Sasha, you're the best. Speaking of fashion, that jacket <laughs> is killer. And and I have to say, I was talking to my sister yesterday and, and telling her about the this panel and she knew about it. It was on her radar anyway. She's also a mom. And she was sharing that, yeah, I was just in Hawaii and saw one of their pods. So I, I have to say that um, from entrepreneur to entrepreneur, founder to founder, I think it is the coolest thing in the world to impact people that you will never know and never meet. And you've had that for thousands and thousands of women, which is really extraordinary and parents. So thank you for the blood, sweat and tears um, <laughs> that many have shed to get this product into the world. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a big fan. So I'm I'm thrilled to be here today. This topic is so near and dear to my heart. As Sasha mentioned, I've been doing this work for just about 12 years. I, I mark my time in this space with my daughter. She's 12 and I started doing it when she was about six months old. So we're, we're about to get to the uh, 12 year mark here. Uh, but Coaching and leadership training fundamentally changed my experience of being a working parent. And our goal at LUMO is to give the tools of coaching and leadership development to every working parent, because we know that when a parental leave is announced in an organization, there are three demographics that are impacted. The employee going out on leave, the manager who supports that employee, and the team left behind. So at LUMO, we provide wraparound support in our Leading Through Leave program that skills up these folks to have a great experience, right? Because we believe that people want to do right by their companies and companies want to do right by their people, but they don't always have the tools and skills to be able to partner in a meaningful way. So 
we're here to talk about that. We're here to talk about how do we actually create workplaces that support new parents. And if we're supporting new parents, we're able to support all the parents. So it's it's really such a thrill. And, and part of what we're doing here is digging into culture, not just policy. Policies are important, um, but going beyond policy into the actual employee experience. So we're, we're going to dive in and we're in for a treat today because we are joined by Dr. Carlos Cruz and Sarah Berkeley. And I'm going to have Dr. Cruz start and introduce himself and share a little bit about why this conversation is so important to him. Welcome, Carlos. Thank you, Sarah, for that kind introduction. And I'm not sure if I'm the all-knowing, but I'm fortunate enough to serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor at of Student Wellbeing and Social Support at Dallas College. And I've been in this the health and wellness space for over eight years and really understanding not just the employee experience and how we can help support our employees and new parents, but also taking it a step further and understanding our student parents and what their student journey and experiences across an institution that serves over 120,000 students annually. So I'm really excited to talk about our um, supports and resources and also looking at policy. But to your point, Sarah, understanding the culture in which we create at Dallas College that is supportive of everyone, it's integrating a different approaches and the ideas of how we can have seamless experiences for all stakeholders across our institution, people visiting our campuses, having our employees being sustained in their work and what they can do and you know to your point how the company wants to do right by to their right by their people but the people also wanting to do right by the company right so as an uh, as an institution of higher education we're really excited about this 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 wonderful work and very privileged to be here amongst some great leaders in this space Oh, Carlos, thank you. Appreciate you. And they're really lucky to have you down there in Dallas. Uh, Sarah, would you introduce yourself and share about why this subject is so important to you? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm Sarah Berkeley, and I'm the Vice President of Wellbeing and Engagement at NFP. We are an insurance broker, so we work with employers on their health insurance and really any benefit that you could get as an employee, um, we help employers with that. I've been here at NFP for just shy of 10 years, so almost a decade. Um, and I've been in the employer well being space for about 15 years. I have a master's in public health. Um, I'm also, uh, I do some advising for some startups and companies that are looking uh, at entering the benefit space, the employer benefit space. Um, I live in Boston, so. Uh, I'm a New Yorker, but I live in Boston now for the past couple of years. I have two young kids who are ages two and four. So um, definitely, personally, I am extremely passionate about this because I have two young kids. So I understand the struggle of trying to work and also take care of toddlers and little babies. Um, also just at my job. I mean, it's something that I talk to our clients about a lot, um, about how they can support working parents, new parents, working parents, um, and different other ways that they can, or programs that they can put into place um, to make sure that their working parents um, are as productive as they can be and as, you know, their health and well-being is taken care of as best as possible. So I know we'll get into that later and I'm very excited to be here. Thanks, Sarah. And, and Sasha, I'd love to circle back with you quickly just to hear a little bit about your passion around this subject. Oh, sure. As I said, uh, as chief experience officer, I think about not only the experience of the folks who are using our pods, but also of my colleagues and the, the um, company that we've created. Um, it's it's funny, at Mama Vi, I feel like we must have a birth rate of 200%. It's like when you work at the Gap and you have a lot of genes. We have a lot of kids. Our CFO actually has five. So um, uh, we think we think about this and we think about uh, creating the space and a conversation around the space around lactation that kind of didn't exist before. And uh, Mama Ba is a mission-based company to solve a problem that I had that my co-founder had um, many, many years ago when we founded 10, 10 years ago. Now my kids are actually 18 and 21. So it's been a long time coming, but 
um, again, creating infrastructure and support for this fundamental human function that didn't exist before. So, so cool. I love it. And this conversation is so timely. I wanted to start off by talking about the op-ed that was just published at the end of August that Dr. Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General, wrote, and it's called, Parents Are at Their Wits End, We Can Do Better. And Megan's going to share all the links for this after and perhaps during if we have the technology. Not only the powerful op-ed that he wrote, but also they authored a 36-page advisory on what working parents are experiencing. And the results blew my hair back. Okay. It just blew my hair back because it was so intense and, and just tough stuff. And, and I want to just share some data as, as we get started and kick off this conversation. First stat, not, not offensive, just, just the facts, ma'am. 63 million parents are living with children under the age of 18, 63 million. And that is not accounting for the millions of non-parent caregivers that we have in the U.S. So we're talking about a lot of people, a lots of people. Um, 41% of parents report being too stressed to function most days. 41% of parents too stressed to function most days. That's really it's not okay. 48% find their stress completely overwhelming. Additionally, in the last decade, childcare prices have grown by approximately 26% in the US. And in the last year alone, one in four parents said they've had trouble meeting their financial basic needs, that they're, they're not able to provide basic needs for their family. So Think about it in this way. It's almost like, imagine a woman with a Surgeon General's warning on her, a pregnant woman, and that's the state of being a working parent in the US. So it's we're, we're getting into really, really challenging territory. And Dr. Murthy says it's, it's on organizations and the government to, to change this. And and in the words of the great Lizzo, we say it's about damn time. It is about damn time. It's it's time for a music break, I say. Um, but but given the sobering statistics, okay, I want to hear from each panelist. Um, and and we'll start with Sarah. What are some of the most impactful policies and practices that employers can implement to support the mental health and well-being of new parents? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, parents often have a a lower mental health and well-being than non-parents in the workplace. So I think first and foremost, what employers can do to support the mental health and well-being is just having access to mental health counselors, whether that be through an EAP, an employee assistance program, um, making sure that their benefits, their health insurance benefits are robust enough that they cover access to counselors, um, that there's a network of, of counselors. There's also some vendors in the space that have their own network of mental health counselors. Um, so just making sure that people have access to counselors um, and making sure that it's it's affordable. Um, so that's the first huge thing. Um, there's a couple others that can certainly that are less specific to mental health, but they kind of support it. So things around paid caregiver leave. So just making sure that there are policies in place that you can get that people can take time off if they need to either have a child or if their child gets sick. Um, that is huge and can affect somebody's mental health and well-being because the stress of having uh, to take off work either unpaid or not being able to take off work when you have a sick child, it is so stressful and really affects people's mental health and well-being. Um, flexibility in the workplace too is really important. Um, so making sure if possible, obviously depending on the industry and the office space, uh, you know, some businesses can be more flexible than others, but as much as possible, trying to provide flexibility in the workplace, um, giving people the opportunity to take care of the things that they need to at home and kind of doing their job also, um, kind of fitting it all in. Um, I think those are probably the ones that, the first ones that sort of stand out to me. Um, I'm sure some others have 
some things to add. Yeah, thanks for that, Sarah. Carlos, what what do you see from a mental health and well-being standpoint? Yeah, no, I think, you know, Sarah brought up some really great points of having that EAP as part of our wellness initiative. But one of the things, too, is incorporating a good transition after some of our new parents take parental leave, right? So there has to be some transitional programming that we've been intentional at our organization and ensuring that transition or that on-ramp back to the workplace is as seamless as possible. So not only having the resources available for them through a mom of all lactation pod or having a serenity space for them just to kind of catch their breath during the day it is important. And we've done a really good job, but having those wellness components as part of the overall well-being for our employees is, is really crucial. And I think over the past four months, we've also evaluated our parental leave. It used to only be six weeks of paid parental leave. We extended that to eight with the potential of 12 if they had some other sick time. So essentially giving our new parents three months to really be with their newborn child or adopted child. And that incorporates, you know, a variety of different situations for new parents, right? Because everyone can become a new parent in a variety of different ways. So incorporating and being inclusive of those needs have been integral and have been supportive of not just our board of trustees, but all of our executive leadership, right? So that for us has been very intentional and that's on the employee side. On the student side, we've taken it a step further because in the state of Texas under Title IX, student parents have some protection as they would, you know, go from a medical withdrawal to, you know, have their child. But we actually implemented through legislation in the state a student parent leave policy where they can get an accommodation, go on, have their 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 child be with them come back and not lose their credit or the momentum on their academic journey we also implemented through our basic needs and community connections department a family care program and the family care program you mentioned the statistics about the child care needs and the the the, the price increase on all of those resources so what we did in our family care program that has really helped out our students is we provide all of the safety and essential equipment for a newborn child, right? So we provide safety equipment such as car seat, high chairs. We provide formulas, diapers, wipes, but it's a three-tiered approach. We're, we're focusing on meeting those basic needs, but then we provide group counseling for all of our student parents, and then provide financial and career literacy programs and workshops for them to think about, okay, now you're, you're a student parent, you're here at the community college, but how can we get you to transfer or earn your credential to have a high living wage career? Right. So all of these aspects fall in line with our wellness initiatives but incorporating twofold, not just employees, but our students, because far too many times our student parents are mar marginalized student populations. They've been overlooked for, like you said, it's about time. Right. It's about time <laughs> that we can focus on these on these students and how it's important for us to provide all of the resources in, 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 in our at our campuses and as an organization for their, for one, their academic success, but also personal success. Carlos, there is so much I love about that. And I just want to give you a big hug. Um, <laughs> first of all, the call back to Lizzo, beautiful. But this policy, this um, transitional programming, this is the most robust actually that I've ever heard. And, and I literally all day, every day, talk to organizations about what they're doing. So huge kudos to you and your team. It is, that is extraordinary. That is the gold star going forward. I'm going to be telling people about the safety equipment, the counseling, the diapers, the whole enchilada. Thank you. That is amazing. Excellent. <laughs> Sasha, how about you? Um, in, in terms of policies, well, I, you know, we are focused uh, again on, on lactation. Um, so I will focus my answer on that. Um, for one thing, employers should know the laws and the laws have kind of fast forwarded um, in recent years with the passage of the Pump Act at the end of 2022 and um, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act at the same time. 
So basically that legislation, which is federal, kind of closed the gap where the country um, across states and even municipalities had different patchworks of what a breastfeeding parent could expect when they um, return to work. But the PUMP Act now basically mandates that all employers have to provide break time and a space that is not a restroom um, for uh, using a breast pump. And um, there is now recourse for the employee who has an employer who hasn't provided proper accommodations to bring um, a lawsuit. So there's just a lot more teeth. And I, I do wanna say that Good policy can change lives. Um, the original Affordable Care Act, which was kind of the first legislation that pr protected um, lactation accommodations, was way back in 2010. It helped launch our business a few, a few years later. Um, and in the last, you know, 10 years, the initiation rates for breastfeeding have gone up by 10 percentage points. So, you know, sub 70, you know, 73 percent of the new parents initiated breastfeeding. Um, and now we're at about 84 percent. So it's this cultural support that actually can influence all the good things that um, breastfeeding can provide for families. Um, and in terms of not just the infant health side of things. We know that there are econ economic factors around around breastfeeding. Um, we know that with the formula shortage we saw a few years ago, people were in a really, really challenging space. And we know that in particular, maternal health outcomes are better if you can spend at least some time breastfeeding that new human. So um, I think policies that are coming down from legislation and then employers who are embracing that and doing the right thing by putting lactation spaces up, by um, having very, very clear um, lactation policies, by making this time in um, their employee's life really visible and really supported. And that's what we focus on. I love that, Sasha. And I love that that last part about visibility and how important it is to actually be out loud about these things. It totally changes the game. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot lately about like, you can't be what you can't see, even mm -hmm. in our sort of political realm, as we go out and talk, I'm like, oh, we, we see more, you know, women are having these conversations or men who are talking about care, right? Yeah. Like Carlos, right? But even in the breastfeeding world, maybe you're maybe you're not going to be a breastfeeding person, uh, or maybe you will someday. But to see that there's a lactation room or a lactation pod in a business you work in says like, oh, I can do that. I, this company is going to support all aspects of my life. A hundred percent. It's sending a message loud and clear that that they care. Yes. Yeah. Love that. Love it so much, Sarah. I've got one for you. Okay. So we're living in this important historical moment where there's significant change. There's a lot happening politically with the upcoming election. There's a lot of focus right now on the care economy. And I'm curious, through the work that you do, what do you see drives change most significantly in the workplace? What what have you seen, Sarah, that works? And where is there still opportunity? Because I know there's often a gap with utilization and things like that. So I'd love to hear, you know, what you've seen in your line that's most impactful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to build on a little bit of what Sasha said in terms of policies and things that have been helpful, under the Affordable Care Act, it did state that insurance had to cover a breast pump. Um, and I feel like that was a huge that was huge. Um, that allows women and breastfeeding people to go back to work and also continue to breastfeed if they choose to. Um, so you don't really have to make the choice, go back to work or breastfeed. You know, now it just, it, it made it it's so much, it's, it was an expensive thing. And so it made it more affordable or it made it free um, and made it just basically easier for um, people to, to breastfeed um, and go back to work. So that was a really big thing. Um, the other thing over the last couple years is um, a bunch of states have na now have paid family leave. Um, and so it varies state to state and not all of the states have them. Um, so some of them are more generous than others. Obviously, we hope that all of the states can kind of 
put something like this into place, or maybe at a federal level, there can be something done. But for now, there are a handful of states where you can get paid family leave. So that means if you either have a baby yourself, um, or if you you don't have to actually be the birthing parent, um, it could be through adoption, surrogacy, um, you can take paid time off. Um, the amount varies and the length varies. So sometimes it's eight weeks up to 12 weeks. Sometimes it's a little bit more, um, depending on the state. Uh, there's usually a percentage of your salary that you can make during that time up to a cap. Um, so it's not 100% pay, but it is, it's better than nothing. And um, it, it, it quite literally is life-saving because a lot of people, a lot of birthing parents, they need to heal. They need time to get themselves, you know, back together, they need, they want to bond with their baby, but they also are worried about their jobs and making money. And so you don't, this sort of helps them not have to make that difficult decision. Um, and then it also allows a partner to stay home and either bond with the child and or support the birthing parent who might need more time while they're recovering. So those paid family leave policies in the States are, have been great. Um, they're not perfect. Sometimes they're a little bit clunky, especially as they're sort of rolling them out. So um, I think the more that people use them, the, the, the smoother the process will be, but it's certainly some really good momentum. Um, the other thing that's been coming up a lot more is universal pre-K and subsidized child care. Um, these are things that have happened um, sort of in patchwork. Um, there was some subsidized child care during COVID um, where people got tax credits and things, um, which I believe actually was recently stopped. Um, so things like that can be really, really life-changing for families um, because, again, as we were discussing, childcare is so expensive. Um, and so giving people access to subsidized or free childcare makes it so that they can work. Um, you know, if you have a little one at home, it's really tough to get work done, um, at least to get work done well. <laughs> so if you want to have people working hard and being productive, you know, these are things that really uh, make a huge, a huge difference. Um, and I hope with the election, you know, these are these are things that are being talked about now. Um, and so hopefully it'll the momentum will continue and these things will expand. Thanks for that, Sarah. I I hear from founders and some smaller business owners and even more mid-level up to enterprise that they really have some challenges around compliance with leave because state to state, it varies so much, right? We don't have a national policy. And for, for international companies, they're saying, you know, we're, we're over in Europe where it's completely different. So it can get really challenging and complicated really quickly. Yeah. And I think especially with global organizations, to your point, it's a, it's an issue of equity, right? And fairness. So, so, okay, my colleagues in Europe or wherever are allowed to have full pay at, you know, six months off, whatever it is. And so what about, what about the people in the U S like, how does that look and how does that work? Um, so it, it, to your point, it can get sticky and complicated. Um, and there's sort of this equity issue of why isn't everybody kind of getting the same option. Right. And not just in Europe, but state to state. That's even, yeah, that absolutely. feels even more awkward. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that. Sasha, tell us a little bit because lactation is your love language. Tell us a little bit about the key components of a lactation program and what does that look like? How, how is it actually beneficial for employees and the organization? Yeah. So I think it's removing questions is really key. And again, as I said, um, setting that intention by having, um, the policy for a lactation policy out there, um, uh, what the expectations are for the employer, what they're going to provide, having this information be shared uh, openly with managers in the um, employee manual, as an example, um, so everybody knows what to expect. Again, we talked about that scary time <laughs> when you are um, going to become a new parent and not having um, everything, you know, everything is new in that case. 
So um, a lactation policy, um, having the law be well understood by all stakeholders, including the employee, um, having a designated lactation space, of course. And again, it doesn't have to be a lactation pod for Mama Va, but um, a designated room that is secured for that purpose, that is a place where you can get into the headspace for those folks who haven't breastfed or um, use a breast pump. There's a psychological component of it as well as physiological. And the two kind of have to, until you get good at it, have to be kind of working in tandem so that that space really, really, really matters. And um, again, when an organization has the infrastructure and support dialed and clear, it kind of takes away the mess, right? HR mm -hmm. people are constantly playing whack-a-mole <laughs> around, um, difficult things to solve. So this is, I think, one of the really easy things you can solve. You can almost tick the boxes by doing the right thing by following um, the, the letter of the law, but also just being ready for the uh, breastfeeding employee. And again, it sig signals even before somebody has a baby um, that there is there it's welcome. And by the way, it also is so much easier and more um, better for your business to hold on to that employee. We know about the replacement. Oh my gosh. Huge. For um, people who leave the workforce yes. and it can cost, you know, another time this is their salary to actually find um, that, that position and replace them. That's your sweet spot, right, Sarah, in terms of keeping um, parents on the sort of manager executive level engaged because they are so valuable to their organizations. Truly, Sasha. And I love that. I really love the you know, it it really, it does check a lot of boxes, but I love, the thing that I love the most about it is the signaling of it's welcome, it's expected, we're ready, we're ready for you, we're ready for your next step as a person um, in this company, it's, it's huge. Um, I wanted to circle back to the child care conversation, and you mentioned it briefly, Sarah, about the child care credits. And I want to reference a study done by friends of LUMO, Vivi in the fifth trimester, where they showed how the taking care of caregivers really impacted the bottom line in terms of engagement, productivity, and things like that. So I want to share just a few data points. And again, Megan the Great will be dropping this in the chat, and it will all come in an email following the webinar. So a few findings from the study that I thought were so important. 69% of caregivers would work in person more, more than required if their employer had on-site subsidized or backup childcare, which is huge because so many of the organizations that I work with still are grappling with how do we get people back? How do we not just mandate it, but make it accessible for people to be back at the office more. So almost 70% would come back if they had subsidized childcare. Nine out of 10 would choose an ongoing childcare subsidy over a one-time cash payment. It really, I mean, that speaks volumes. And 59%, almost 60% would stay in their job for at least four years if they had backup or subsidized childcare. And Again, to Sasha's point around the economics of this, it companies are saving millions and millions of dollars by actually retaining those great employees that they want to keep. And then finally, something that I loved was that what, what caregivers say is that 4.2 out of 5, that they're more motivated to be effective and productive um, when their caregiving needs are met. So it's, there's so much from a business standpoint, and it's so important that stakeholders and the people that are advocating for this on this call, because we know a little bit that the people who are here were preaching to the choir, that y'all already care about working parents, or you wouldn't be taking the time out of your day to learn about this. But it's really important that we have data that supports what we already know. It's not just good to do or right to do, it's good for business. So I wanna come back to Carlos and talk about 
the the amazing and cool work that you're doing down there and we know how important retention is but i want to talk about attracting so what attracts both your employees and your student parent um your student parents to come to dallas college what yes i no, yes, sir. I think that it's a culmination of all the good things we've been talking about, right? And one of the most important factors, and one that's now jump on this child care piece, we have an integrated collaboration with the YMCA of Dallas, where we are now bringing on site drop in child care for not just our students, parents, but also for some of our employees. So it could be where they can get you know, four hours of free subsidized drop-in child care, and then probably get a babysitter for the rest of their shift, right? So as we look at being the best place to work, we're not in that category just yet as Dallas College, but looking at becoming the best place to work really entices not just our talent pool for employees, but what we can provide our student parents here at the institution. So looking at the overall holistic journey for both of those populations here at Dallas College is what we really strive ourselves in, in shining and being able to provide that to our students free of charge. One of the things that we also do as an institution is we don't charge any fees for these resources. Our students have one payment of tuition and everything is included. And the Board of Trustees has been really intentional with ensuring that we can minimize the cost factor for our students, but then also minimize any barriers that may be for our new parents that, you know, just, you know, have a newborn at home and why they, you know, extended that parental leave. But all of these things come at full circle, right? And giving them a comprehensive package, right? It's not just about recruiting top talent and recruiting them, but it's also about providing all of the necessary resources for them to be successful in their career and the same for our students successful in their academic journey. But what you'll hear from our chancellor time after time is that we're in the barrier busting business. And the barrier busting business is how do we remove challenges or barriers to life circumstances, right? And I think it's humanizing that experience. So it's no longer you're the employee, you're the staff, I'm your manager. It's a matter of, let me understand your needs, Sarah. And how can we look at those basic needs and thinking of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And if we can really get to self-actualization as a team and as a person and what that means for you in your personal journey, in your career, we want to meet you where you're at, right? So it's just kind of turning it on its head and implementing, because we talk about the student experience, but it's also about the employee. And if the employee is not happy, if the employee doesn't have all of the same resources, then how can we function as an organization and providing that to our students when in fact we can't even do that for our employees, right? So it, it comes twofold for us, and that's really the 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 mentality and the the perception and perspective in which we attack some of these challenges across the board now are we a perfect organization absolutely not right there are always things that we have to assess for continuous quality improvement but you know having legislation having federal laws that give us the opportunity to put some of these things in place as Sasha was saying, you get more teeth behind it, right? But then you really are invested in guaranteeing an employee experience or a student experience that attracts people of wanting to be at your organization, right? And that's part of our wellness initiatives for employees. That's part of our well-being and student success initiative that you know I get to uh, oversee, but you know where it really complements each other because there's also we also have part-time student employees. So you have that kind of coalescing at the same time. So we wanna make sure that we have our employee benefits available to some of these student parents, and then also our student parents, the type of resources that they receive. And more in particularly, one of the other things where in higher education, you'll see a challenge is you have all of the 
co-curricular experiences that are available to our students, but also engaging our faculty of all of the resources available to their students as well. Faculty may or may not know what's available. So integrating into the classroom, providing information through our learning management system, which is a system that students access their courses, receive their homework or their grades. It just reiterates here, we're in midterms, we're here to support you. If you're a student parent, here's what we have. If you are needing some food, you have some housing or food insecurities, here's what we can provide to you, right? So it's just reimagining that full experience and what I think we do a good job at attracting talent for employees and then attracting our students to come to Dallas College and saying, here's the value of the education and the world-class education you'll receive at Dallas College. As long as you can get through the front door, we will guide you to that graduation stage. It's amazing. Carlos, it's funny. I think that um, one of the one of my favorite things that you said was talking about humanizing the experience. Exactly. And at Lumo, one of our values is human-centric leadership. Yes. Um, and we we have to start with human beings. We have to that's that's the baseline that um, and there's a dignity and there's an opportunity. But I will say that, um, you know, doing this work a long time, that really what y'all are doing is really above and beyond. It's it's on the it's on the really strong side of look at look at what we're providing, look at what we're doing, look at how we care. Um, because I hear some of the biggest companies in the world saying we can't afford it. And and what they're actually saying is we don't want to afford it. We're not willing to afford it. It's not a priority. And it just, it's really, really inspiring for me to hear you share about the ways in which you're not just saying we care about people, but here's how we actually care about people. And um, I will say this too for you, Carlos, we get immune over time to the things that we're really good at, or we take them for granted. We're like, yeah, sure, that's, yeah. just, that's just Tuesday, everybody, no biggie. But I, I just want to let you know that what you're sharing is actually a biggie. It's a biggie. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, Sarah, you're, you're our benefits, babe, you're our benefits <laughs> maven. So I want to hear, um, your favorite most innovative benefits packages and, and Carlos is, you know, an undercover benefits babe, but, but what's, what's your favorite most innovative things that you are seeing out there? Yeah. So obviously this is a huge issue. I talk about with my clients all the time. It's also, it's an inclusivity issue. And it's sort of interesting when Carlos was talking, I was thinking about it because when I speak to my clients, it's really, I mean, childcare predominantly falls on women, right? And that was, that's why so many women left the workforce during COVID. Um, it's often why they leave the workforce in general. And so I'm listening to Carlos and I'm thinking too, probably it's really helpful for women who are students to continue to get their degree and their education, which then lends itself to earning potential over the years. So I just think it has these ramifications that go well beyond their time at your organization, right? It helps society as a whole. Um, so, and yeah, so there's a bunch of, um, some of the best programs that I've seen as we've sort of discussed are the caregiver support. Um, mm -hmm. So those are things like backup childcare, discounts um, or subsidized um, memberships to child care centers, on-site child care if possible. I know that's not always possible. Um, reimbursing for out-of-care, out-of-network caregivers, um, digital resources. There's um, coaching and care coordinators. To, so there's sort of this navigation of where do I go if I need help um, to help care for a child. So there's so many um, there's a lot of companies and vendors out there now who are offering these things. We offer it at NFP, um, and I have so many more clients who are um, trying to put these types of programs in place if they haven't already done so. So, And these are things that employees will leave their jobs to go somewhere where they can get this wow. type of support. Um, and frankly, your, your employees are going to do a better job if they have access to caregivers. So having a backup program, I personally have used it a bunch of times, the one that NFP offers. Um, and it has been 
a lifesaver. I mean, just to be able to get a, a last minute babysitter when my childcare fell through, I had an important meeting. Um, my husband is a surgeon. He cannot cancel his surgeries. So, you know, it always sort of falls to me. Um, and it has been, it, it has saved me several times. Um, a few other things too are, you know, I've mentioned it already that the paid caregiver leave. So looking at your parental leave policies, both paternity and maternal maternity leaves, um, trying to expand that as much as you can. Um, flexibility, also super important, um, allowing hybrid options if possible. If that's not possible, maybe there are ways that people can sort of change their shifts if it's a shift work type of program. So are you able, is that easy to do to sort of just swap shifts for things like that? Um, you know, these are just things that'll allow people to accommodate their life, right? And and if there's pro, if there are things going on at home, they're really not going to be that focused at work. So everyone is sort of better off if they have some flexibility so they can deal with some of these things. Um, of course, lactation rooms um, and or or like, you know, a space for for mothers to to express their milk if they want to. And then lastly, I will say and this is um a little bit more harder to pinpoint, but just the culture too. I mean, there needs yes. to be this culture within an organization of acceptance. There needs to be people in leadership actually participating in the programs, talking about the programs, mm. need to lead by example. And, you know, need people need to show transparency when, when they themselves are struggling. It's important to, to say that to your team if you're a leader, right? Say, hey, you know what, my kid's homesick today. I, I'm not going to be as, you know, active as I normally am, or I'll get back to you tonight after bedtime or, you know, whatever it is. So I just think that kind of helps lend to a culture where people are comfortable talking about it. They feel like it's okay. If you're doing your job well, you're getting your work done, um, then, you know, things come up and we all, we all sort of need to understand that. And that just comes back to the culture. Yeah, Sarah, I'm so glad you brought in the culture piece because in my experience, it's the most important. People can have policies for days, but if the culture doesn't match the policy, it's yeah. it, it creates mistrust and misalignment. There's an organization that we do manager training for. And when we went in to speak to them, they said, we have wonderful policies and our managers are not great people leaders. And I mean, they're get, their people get massages, all kinds of things. Carlos, we put that in the future planning for Dallas College, the massage stations. But, you know, they get massages, all these things. Meanwhile, an employee announces leave and the manager says, well, Q4 isn't good for me. Right. Isn't good for us. And it's like, you know what happens to those massages? They're meaningless. It's empty. It doesn't matter anymore because the that human element is missing. Um, a friend of yeah, mine. It's, it, it's in, no, I was gonna say it's important to just it's humanizing that experience as part of your culture, and that just just takes a shift because you can provide all of the resources, but that one moment where it becomes problematic, or it's the companies and you know in goals or ideas that come before you as a person, then you've lost all credibility and trust in what you truly have intended those resources to be, right? So I think it, it there's always flexibility in what you can do. It's just a matter of how you present it. And yes. it's not forever, right? We know it's not forever, but having a child is part of life and everyone has to go through it. And I was going to share, we just updated one of our policies or practices that we had for children on campus before we had a very stringent policy where student parents couldn't bring their child in the event that they didn't have child care and they couldn't go into the classroom. Faculty would say, no, you can't come to class. We've we re -ramp, we revamped that policy to ensure that we're humanizing that experience for everyone. And we know everybody gets emergencies. We know not everyone can get childcare. I know in the, in the past couple of months, what I think last month there was a big wave of COVID. So a lot of the childcare places were, you know, closing down for like a couple of days because everybody got sick. So they had to bring their kids to school, right? They don't want to miss class, but they just have to accommodate. Day. And that's a real different shift in lens. So as we kind of talk about 
just us being humans first, right? And I think the pandemic showed us how to be human, right? And, you know, at the end of the day, the work's going to be there. And I know there's profits and there's Q4s and, you know, all of these things that we have to think about. I'm not in the corporate world, but we know that there are goals we have to meet. And essentially, if you've planned and have prepared your team, you're you're willing and able to really just know that that servant leadership needs to come into place and how you can really provide that support. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Carlos. Did yeah. you have something, Sasha? Yeah, I do think just sort of the visibility that the pandemic brought into our world around care. So I know we're talking about hard things, but the momentum around um, the care economy that we're seeing in, in from um, policymakers. And um, I think that it's uh, we're all growing as a society for visibility around this, which is exciting. And I had one small suggestion in our space of breastfeeding. Um, we talked about humanizing some of these challenges. Um, even in a small company, you can think about this idea of finding a bosom buddy. And having, uh, if you have, if you know you have breastfeeding em uh, employees or new mothers, um, there's usually somebody who's done that before you, even if it was 20 years ago. And that person can be both coaching you on what it's like to be, you know, back in the workplace, but also running interference because it's a time when you might be needing to take that break, and you might have a great employer who's provided a lactation space or a pod. Um, but then you're missing the meeting that you might have been in otherwise, right? So finding that colleague who is going to kind of support you in this phase in your life, it's a pretty short phase, you know, between six and a year or, or, or however long you are trying to um, breastfeed. Uh, but even thinking about things that are not written into a lactation policy, but more on the human scale, if this is something you care about um, as a manager or as a breastfeeding parent who wants to kind of uh, spread and facilitate that in somebody else, like that, just think about that bosom buddies idea. And we have a, we have a, um, a mobile app and one of the top features besides finding lactation spaces is actually words of support. And it's moms who are leaving words of support for other moms because they know it's kind of like this set period of, of your life and it's a lot of work. You've got your job, you've got your family, and then you have this breastfeeding thing you're doing. So just recognizing that in each other and, and your colleagues who are breastfeeding is just can be a lot in a, in a really positive way. It's a very isolating time too. You can it's feel very that. isolating. You're like, oh, great. I got to use my breast pump, but I missed this important meeting or, you know, things like that. For sure. So I know, Sarah, are you looking at the question? I'm looking at the chat. It right. is blowing up. We need an hour for the chat. So and I think we can we can cycle back with some of the content that we share. Um, yeah. And I and, think that we can take anything yeah. that we don't get to and include it in the follow up email to address at a high level. Um, so what do we say? We'll start at the top and just see how far we can get with some speed answers. How does that sound? That works. Speed round. Right. That's speed round. This is a speed round. Let's do it. How do you rectify when you are making improvements in policy, but it's still not enough? Six week pay, six weeks paid is an improvement. Still not enough. I don't, I don't even know what day it was at that point. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I think that, uh, again, this is momentum around um, paid leave. We are, um, very much involved with an organization called the Chamber of Mothers who is advocating for um, national um, paid paid family and parental leave. Now we think about family leave too, because you know many of us are in that sandwich generation now taking care of our elders. The other organization that is investing a lot of time and has a ton of great resources is called Caring Across Generations, which uh, is a wonderful, uh, very uh, powerful organization. These are the folks that if we can pass paid leave in this country, they will be behind it. So um, keep on um, keep on voting. <laughs> um, and we totally agree, six weeks is not enough. Agree wholeheartedly. All right. Robin Bell, what percentage, and this is going to be you, Sasha, what percentage of U.S. companies over 100 employees have installed lactation pods? I would hope that, I mean, it's not um, always pods, right? We are, Our mission is around lactation spaces, although we do make pods. I don't know that statistic, but I would hope that 100% of companies of over 100 employees have lactation spaces. By law, they have to. Mm, yeah, it would be interesting to know what the actual stat is. Mm. 
We think about yep. that. Mm-hmm. Sasha, is there significant adoption resistance by companies despite the Pump Act and the potential lawsuits? Uh, to be honest with you, uh, it is the adoption is slower than we would like. And I think sometimes um, companies think that an employer is not going to issue issue a uh, call to uh, make the accommodation because they will make a, a lawsuit they're concerned about there. But there are protections against retaliation for asking for this accommodation. So um, in the information that um, our colleague Meg is going to send out, all of that will be there. Um, I will be honest, it, it can be slow going. And I think a lot of what happens in those organizations is they're cre- creating something that's maybe good enough, like, oh, we have this storage closet, it's not a bathroom, and it has a lock. That really isn't go- good enough. Um, but by the letter of the law, it might pass. Um, and I think a lot of these organizations who are not creating accommodations are waiting for the problem to go away. So Folks, don't let the problem go away. Assert your expectation that there's lactation accommodations. Thanks for that, Sasha. One of the things that I always say to new parents, expecting parents, you know, parents of children of any age is that you need to advocate for yourself as strongly as you would advocate for your child. Or find that bosom buddy, because maybe that person can help you too. Go together. (laughs) Both okay. have at it. Uh, power numbers. Uh, Lord says, I agree we're through a good momentum with the Pumped Act in the PPFA, which provides legal and financial support to families. Policies do not ensure the full u- utilization of the benefits. We need to work hard on culture as well. Besides appropriate training to managers and supervisors, any other suggestions to improve culture? Um. Sarah, did you have it? I've got something. Yeah. I mean, I think some of it is sort of some of the things that I talked about. Um, So again, like having leadership talk about it, be open about it, promoting it, participating in these types of programs. Um, Definitely training is is important as well. Um, I mean, changing policies, if you're going from nothing to something or just improving them also is sort of around the culture too. Um, yeah, employee think- resource groups. I mean, we have seen that yeah. in some of our big accounts where the employees themselves yeah. became, uh, you know, the parent employee resource group became powerful enough to actually change policy. And I'm talking about some of the biggest companies in the world. So that is, um, that's a, that's a good one. Beautiful. And I see my friend Yoko is here, who is amazing. We met when our babies were little teeny weeny babies. And she's a part time doula lactation educator. Um, And she'd love to provide students with their rights as advocacy tools. There's there's a woman, the mama attorney. She does a lot of work on that. I'm sure she's probably on your radar, but perhaps we can include in the email any other resources that we have around advocacy. Um, As a working parent, I've mostly worked for small companies, 25 and under mostly with non-parent leaders and frequently as a freelancer, how do people exercise their rights in smaller work environments? It's so hard. It's, it's so hard. hard for freelancers and independent contractors. Sarah, do you have something? I mean, I just it, this is easier said than done for some people, but I, I just think it's becoming more commonplace. And I hope that that empowers people to speak up and to say, hey, I really need this time. Um, I will say, you know, blocking time out on your calendar and you make it a private appointment, whatever it is, if you know, so that you have time to go pump, um, you know, trying to, if you can, depending on your industry, scheduling meetings around those times, things like that. Um, I think it's, it's just trying, if you are in a position of power, if you are some kind of leader speaking up, um, trying to, if you, you know, if you have an employee who is going out on leave or having a baby, I mean, talking to them about it, I, I think that's having conversations around it and just advocating is really the best that you can do at this point and knowing that you do have the law on your side in many cases. 
Yeah. I know yeah. we're, I, we're almost done here, but there was a question that came up about using um, flexibility uh, as a blanket statement that we will deal with like lactation or uh, on a case by case basis. And as, and I know we're coming to the end of our time, we thank everybody for spending so much time with us, but at Mama Ball, we are a manufacturer and we have an office environment. We give everybody the same um, benefits and pay time off and so on. But obviously in that manufacturing environment, there is different expectations expectations. So first of all, I'm a firm believer in very concrete um, uh, policies, but you have to know that in some situations you have to have different accommodations, right? The person who is working from their desk might be able to do something besides the person who's working at a router machine. So um, I think that's a good one for us to follow up on how we have done it. And I know that in, it seems like there's a few folks in law enforcement Thank you for your service. That those are incredibly difficult jobs. They're incredibly gendered. I'm sure. <laughs> I can only imagine um, that they have workarounds there where you, you know, may be put on more of a, a desk type of position for that time. And I believe that there are special uh, specifications under the law that actually um, that that the, that those are legal changes. Those are correct uh, applications of of how accommodations are made. So Sarah, we're at our end here. We, it so happens so fast. Hours. It happens so fast. And we could go on and on. And we're going to send fo a follow-up with links. Our emails will be included. Feel feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to talk about this. We're, we, we literally are here uh, to be in these conversations and support you. We're just so grateful for your attendance and keep talking about this. Keep asking about it as my best friend says, dare to bother, dare to bother about this. I love, yes, so yeah, team. make those pumping times on your calendar public, Sarah. I want to make those public so everybody knows right. what you're doing. That's Help true. normalize it. That's Sarah, true. Thank public. And Sasha, I just want to say thank you for having me and the crystal that- um... <laughs> Okay, well, That's up for a whole nother webinar. Thank you, everybody. We will send this information, Carlos, Sarah. Sarah you, and our friend Meg uh, behind the scenes here. Thanks for a great um, event. We'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thanks Sasha. Appreciate Thanks. you all.